and admitting everybody. Okay. Upstairs. Yeah. Okay, um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Professor John Ellishaw. I'm the um, chair of the executive committee of the International Collaborative for Best Care for the Dying. Welcome to this webinar today. Um, I'd ask everybody if they could be muted and maybe video off until we get to the discussion part of the webinar. Um, I'd like to um, introduce today's meeting, which is Global Challenges for Opioid Use in Care for the Dying Person. And we have two, two distinguished speakers, Dr. Ben Bowers and Professor Jim Cleary. But first, a few um, um, comments about the collaborative itself. Next slide. So we have 253 members of the International Collaborative from six continents around the globe. We're very proud of our internationalism and um, hope that maybe you might consider joining if you're not, not already a member. Next slide. Um, the vision of the collaborative is a world where all people experience a good death as an integral part of their individual life, supported by the very best personalized care. Next slide. So what we do is we, as a collaborative, do international research and development. Our main program at the moment is around a EU horizon program called the I Live program, which is um, the largest cohort um, study that's been undertaken, particularly looking at what and how um, influences where people are cared for and how they're cared for when they're dying. Um, linked with our research and development, we have a learning and teaching and quality assurance program, which underline mm -hmm. our, underpin our 1040 model, which is a model to support care at the bedside um, to provide the very best care for the dying person and their families. So we're very proud of our, our link from research into practice through learning and teaching and quality assurance. So today's meeting is about global challenges for opioid use in care for the dying person. Um, we have um, two distinguished speakers. Um, they will do their presentations um, synchronously. Um, so Ben will present then um, Professor Jim Cleary. Uh, then we will have discussions and questions at the end and we shall finish um, promptly um, on time. So our first speaker is Dr. Ben Bowers. He, he, um, he is a practicing community palliative care nurse and welcome postdoctoral research fellow with the Palliative End of Life Care Group at the University of Cambridge. Ben's recent mixed methods doctoral research investigated community end of life anticipatory prescribing practice and perspectives of this care. His ongoing research interests are about using end of life care medications at home. And Ben is the co-founder of the UK-wide QNI Community Nursing Research Forum. So Ben is well placed to um, talk to his title of "Is having access to end of life anticipatory medications in the home reassuring and helpful?" So over to you, Ben. Welcome and thank you for contributing to our webinar today. Brilliant. Thank you, John. I'm just trying to share my screen, and hopefully get us onto full. There we go. So, thank you ever so much. Is having access to end of life anticipatory medications in a home reassuring and helpful? So, this session, I'm going to cover an updated systematic review of the published evidence regarding anticipatory prescribing, then, patients, informal caregivers, and clinicians' experiences of, of um, anticipatory prescriptions themselves. There's a QR code just at the bottom uh, of your screen, and that's to a recent paper which has come out today on some of the research I'm going to be presenting. 
So although the research focuses on the care of adults in the community, it is transferable to hospital and hospice settings, areas where there's even less research into anticipatory prescribing. Hmm, bit of a background, and forgive me for those who are very familiar with anticipatory prescribing, but anticipatory medications, as shown in the picture, are injectable drugs prescribed ahead of possible need for administration if distressing symptoms arise in the final days of life. Drugs including opioids are prescribed and left in the home for symptoms of pain, nausea and vomiting, agitation and respiratory secretions. Permission is given when these drugs are prescribed for visiting nurses and doctors to use the prescriptions based on their own assessment of clinical need. This is considered best practice internationally. However, in signifying the imminence of death, these medicines, particularly opioids, carry great symbolic and emotional impact. So during my recent PhD, I systematically reviewed the evidence regarding anticipatory prescribing, and we investigated published empirical studies from across the world. Very briefly, our systematic review asked, with regard to anticipatory prescribing for injectable medications for adults dying in the community, what is current practice? Then what are the attitudes of patients, informal caregivers and healthcare professionals? What is anticipatory prescribing's impact on comfort and symptom, symptom control? And is the intervention cost effective? An earlier version of our review is published in Palliative Medicine, and you can find that by the access using the QR code at the bottom of the screen. Today, I'm going to present our updated 2021 review results. So nine databases were searched along with hand screening of included studies, uh, their reference searching, and also citation searching for those, and two journal hand searches were done. Papers were included if they presented empirical re research for adults receiving care at home in the community. The quality and relevance of the evidence for included studies were independently appraised by two reviewers using Goff's weight of evidence framework. A data synthesis used a narrative approach. This enabled us to bring together both qualitative and quantitative studies. And results, there were 58 papers reporting on 40, 54 studies in total. So what is current practice? Well, anticipatory prescribing is widespread community practice in the UK, Australia, Canada, and Norway. Prescriptions vary, rates vary from 14% to 96% of deaths in the community, dependent on the services involved. There is wide variation in the reported timing of prescriptions prior to death, and this ranges depending on studies from a few days to weeks to months before death reflecting different prescribing cultures and different difficulties in accurately predicting dying for patients, particularly those with non-cancer diagnoses. But patients with advanced cancer and specialist palliative care involvement are much more likely to be prescribed drugs. There is limited data on whether drugs are actually used and the timing of first drug administration to death. It appears that midazolam and opioids are the most frequently administered anticipatory medications. So only one published paper to date has directly investigated patients' attitudes regarding anticipatory medications. The prescribing of anticipatory medications is a significant event for patients and clearly signifies the imminence of death. No patients, however, in this study had experience of the drugs being administered. Four studies have investigated family carers' attitudes regarding Nurse, nurses administering anticipatory medications. Two interview studies found that prescriptions were accepted in the home by families despite inadequate explanations when drugs were prescribed, often because symptoms of suffering were expected at the end of life, so informal carers thought it was wise to have these drugs available. A survey of bereaved informal caregivers found that most reported that they were reassured by the prescriptions being available and that administered medications helped with symptoms. So there's a different practice which goes on and informal caregivers attitudes have been more extensively investigated with studies of initiatives to train fam in family carers or informal carers themselves to give those injectable medications. This is a context which does not reflect standard practice in most countries. However, it is standard practice in Australia and New Zealand 
um, and a few other countries. Seven studies reported that informal caregivers found that training packages were acceptable and that being able to give drugs was empowering and beneficial to patient comfort. Yet, two service evaluations reported that relatively few informal caregivers were willing or able to take on this role. 35 studies report on the attitudes and experiences of healthcare professionals, predominantly doctors and nurses working in the UK and Australia. Clinicians believe anticipatory prescriptions offer reassurance to all involved, provide timely and effective symptom control, and help prevent crisis hospital admissions. Family doctors and nurses also express safety concerns about the potential for drug error or misuse, particularly around the use of opioids. Robust evidence of the, clin the clinical effectiveness of anticipatory prescribing is absent. No intervention trial has been undertaken to date. Two surveys of nurses and a survey of bereaved informal caregivers suggest that having access to anticipatory medications may contribute to symptom relief. And then robust evidence of cost effectiveness of the intervention is also absent, although this is a low cost intervention. The typical cost of supplying two to three days worth of medication in the UK is between £22 and £30 per patient, and drug wastage is estimated to be between £10 and £50, £15 per patient. Two small scale audits and one service evaluation identified that most patients with a prescription were not admitted to hospital for symptom control at the end of their life. Crucially, however, these studies do not report the outcomes of patients who were not prescribed anticipatory medications. Basically, there was no comparison group. So, in conclusion, our updated review found that policy and practice remains primarily based on clinicians' beliefs that access to anticipatory medications offers reassurance to all and facilitates effective symptom control. We really need to understand how frequently prescriptions are used and for what symptoms they're used. Patients and informal caregivers' experiences of anticipatory prescribing requires urgent investigation, and further research is needed to investigate the clinical effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and safety of anticipatory prescribing. So the second section of my presentation will help fill some of the missing knowledge regarding patients and families' experiences. Bye. Understand... Bye. I'll continue. Understanding Community Anticipatory Medication Care, a qualitative interview study. This research today has, has been published today in Age and Aging. So our research question was, what are patients, informal caregivers and their clinicians' views and experiences of decisions to prescribe and use anticipatory medications? Methods? I conducted a qualitative multi-perspective interview study with patients, informal caregivers, and their clinicians, and we used a patient case based approach, recruiting patients from two diverse counties within England. Dying patients and informal caregivers took part in up to three interviews over four months. As you can see in this diagram, this was on recruitment, if drugs are used, and then regardless if medications are used, two to four months later. A doctor or community nurse involved in each patient's case was invited to take part in a separate interview at the end of the study follow-up period. Recruitment and interviews took place between May and December 2020. This study provides really rich, unique data into the end-of-life care during a pandemic. Semi-structured interviews were by phone or video calls, and these explored views and experiences of anticipatory medication conversations and care and data were analysed inductively using thematic analysis. So results. There were 11 patient cases, six patients, nine informal caregivers, three GPs, that's family doctors, and three community nurses took part in 28 semi-structured interviews. Five patients had multiple terminal conditions and five had a terminal cancer diagnosis. Anticipatory medications are used in the end in seven of the 11 patient cases and six of the patients died during the study follow-up period. Drugs were prescribed between five days and 294 days before death, or the last follow-up interview if patients were still alive. Three overarching themes were constructed from the data and pseudonyms have been used. I'm gonna go through each of the themes in turn. Theme one, living in the presence while making plans. Anticipatory medications were used by clinicians 
as a practical tool in the planning for future unknowns, will patients and informal caregivers try to concentrate on living in the present? The prescriptions of anticipatory medications usually accompanied or followed clinician discussions of advanced care planning. These were typically reported to be framed in, as one-off conversations, which clinicians framed in hopeful terms and making plans to help patients remain at home and to be comfortable, encouraging the bracketing of thoughts once dying plans have been made. Some anticipatory medications were prescribed without discussions, however, and only one patient and two informal caregiver participants recalled having detailed conversations with clinicians about these medications being prescribed to control end-of-life care symptoms. 11 patients and informal caregivers drew on a range of tactics to make sense of prescriptions when they recalled receiving insufficient explanations. They often read the accompanying medication chart or searched for names of the drugs on the internet to find out what they were for. Or five participants use the interviews that I, they had with myself to ask more questions about the drugs. Patients often held concurrent and contradictory views regarding the amount of reassurance for anticipatory medications offered. For some, the presence of these medications was simultaneously comforting and an unwelcome reminder of impending death. As Katie shared with me, anticipatory med um, sorry, Katie shared with me, it's a bit of a comfort to know that it's there, it's up in the corner and it's out of the way, and I don't look at it if I can help it. Anticipatory medications were also perceived to be a physical and significant sign that death was approaching. These drugs were often in the home for weeks or months. So theme two was anticipation of dying. Patients and informal caregiver participants reported that they rarely discuss explicitly the process of dying or the possible symptoms that may occur with clinicians. They were concerned that dying could be painful and distressing without drugs. Now, whether the act of being prescribed anticipatory medications had served to put this idea into participants' minds was unclear. Anticipatory med medications were perceived to be a useful intervention to help with symptoms, but patients really didn't consider them to be central in relieving the pressures on their families when they were dying. Unclear conversations about the role of anticipatory medications or conflicting the concurrently held views on the effects of those medications left some questioning where the drugs will speed up the dying process. I read Abby's sh shared voice to perspective with me during a second interview. She shared this as she became physically weaker and less able to do the activities that she really enjoyed. I'm perfectly happy to be assisted on my way. And if they help me, anticipatory medications, then they help me. I mean, if I was a Labrador and my Labrador was suffering, to be honest, then I'll put him down. Theme three, accessing timely care. Getting anticipatory medications administered poses a significant challenge for families. Despite previous clinicians' assurances that these drugs would be given by nurses, if needed, medications were given in the end in seven of the eight patient cases where their administration had been requested. So informal caregivers reported it was difficult to get nurses to start giving anticipatory medications for symptoms of pain and distress, especially if they were not physically in the same place when the nurses came to visit to request that they were used. Patient participants in, who were, in, were converse, they really didn't experience the same issues and they found that the requests for drugs were swiftly met. Participants also reported it was much easier to get nurses to administer further doses once drugs had been started. That first injection set a precedent. Most participants reported that symptoms were partially or fully relieved with periodic injections or after the commencement of continuous medications via a syringe pump or syringe driver. However, most informal caregivers found it hard to understand the bureaucratic clinical systems designed to ensure the continued appropriate use of medications. The difference in skills, experience and judgments of visiting nurses posed a problem for informal caregivers. They really struggled to understand why one individual nurse would not give medications or interpreted prescriptions differently to their colleagues who visited before. Consequently, families spent a lot of time carrying out hidden work to ensure that medication supplies and valid drug charts, those that no one could dispute, were available. Mark shared with me 
we found ourselves doing a lot of backward, backward and forthing to pharmacies and the doctors to get stuff we needed. And that was quite frustrating. So in overall conclusion, anticipatory medications are not as reassuring as the existing evidence base and policies suggest. Clinicians, clinicians decided when to prescribe these medications and often provided vague information about drugs and the process of dying. Consequently, the presence of anticipatory medications in the home was simultaneously reassuring, a source of unease, and for some, a reminder of approaching death. Administered medications generally help with comfort and symptom control. However, the limited voice that informal caregivers had in getting these drugs administered and the considerable hidden work that they carried out in organising supplies added to the stresses that he experienced in the final days of life. So I'm going to propose that decisions to administer medications should take into consideration informal, care informal caregivers considerable insights into patients' comfort, especially when patients themselves can no longer communicate. And I'm investigating how systems are using these injectable medications could be improved as part of my welcome postdoctoral fellowship. Feel free to get in touch and I'm going to hand you back over to John now. Thank you, Ben. That was really very interesting. I've, I've got too many questions myself, um, but if you have questions, then please put them in the chat and we'll come to uh, um, questions and discussions after our next speaker. But I think it is um, really fascinating, Ben, just to kind of think of something that's quite accepted practice, how little we know of the impact of it. And also, I was surprised that when you put up four countries and said it's common practice there, but I was wondering about the, the other hundred and however many countries there are in the world. So it's very interesting. And I think that, that segues me nicely into our next speaker, who will be talking about um, worldwide issues. Um, Professor Jim Cleary, um, I'm delighted to we welcome you to the webinar today. Jim is Professor and Walter Senior Chair of Supportive Oncology at Indiana University School of Medicine and Medical Director and Director of Supportive Oncology at Indiana University Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, Jim has led a number of global initiatives in palliative care, including the Glo Global Opioid Policy. He's a member of the Lancet Commission on Palliative Care and co-chair of ASCO's Resource Stratified Guideline on Palliative Care. He also serves as North American editor of the Journal of Palliative Medicine. Jim was honored recently as one of 30 global visionaries in palliative care by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care, and was a 2021 recipient of the Floriana Lecture Award from the European Association of Palliative Care. Quite a CV. Um, Jim, we're delighted that you're joining us today, and um, we look forward um, to hearing about a more global perspective now about um, opioids and I think something that you've been passionate about throughout your career about making opioids available to people throughout the world so I'm looking forward to hearing how far down that track we've got so over to you. John thank you very much and this is a very good segue to come from having these medicines available in the United Kingdom to the rest of the world where many of these medications and are not available. And I'm using the term medicines. I know Ben and many of us drop into the use of the word drugs at times, but these are medicines that we're talking about and absolutely critical. But the controlled medicines in particular, um, opioids, and we'll go to that next slide. There we go. Yeah. Um, as we look at uh, the opioids available, um, Opium has been available in, for many years, morphine identified in 1811, and really became commonly used um, because of the Civil War and the development of the hypodermic syringe. But then in the late 1800s, we saw heroin developed, um, thought to be uh, a, a less addictive option to uh, morphine. Uh, we have oxycodone and the uh, the stories that have gone on with that in particularly the United States and fentanyl available to us. So we have all these medicines available to us in many of the well-resourced uh, countries going forward. The Single Convention of Narcotic Drugs was uh, passed by the United Nations in 1961. And this was to ensure access to medicines for scientific and medical purposes while reducing diversion. Um, so 
I would say this was the first UN medical treaty because it was done to ensure access to these medicines. And around this same time, we see the development of Dame, well, not the development, we saw Dame Cecily Saunders' work. Um, here she is as a nurse. And then she went on to discover St. Christopher's um, work that was recognized by Google with one of the little hidden pictures for Dame Cecily as we went forward. But I got to visit with Dame Cecily, and this is a picture of my wife with her. Um, it was actually 20 years ago, I realized as the World Cup was on, because we cut short our visit to go and watch Ireland play soccer in a, uh, or football as you call it over there, um, in uh, the game rather than having a tour of the place. But I got to present her with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy. What's significant about Dame Cecily's work is that she really identified an issue that the nuns working in hospices in London had um, identified, that giving morphine round the clock actually improved the quality of life of patients dying in their hospices. My mother was a hospice nurse, went back after uh, raising a family. I'm not sure if she did that good a job. Um, but she actually gave the first dose of oral morphine in Adelaide, Australia, in the hospice there. And here is a picture. This was while I was a medical student. So I think this is a significant advance forward in many places in the world that we actually moved to uh, administering morphine regularly. I was looking as a medical student to do an elective in um, St. Christopher's, had got this interest. Um, but the opportunity came up for me to go to Calcutta, India. And that Jim, was eye-opening for I, me. Jim, can I interrupt a second? Can you can you try to use slideshow? Because we're seeing the preview screen at the moment. Thank you very much, John. I yes. will do that. These, and these I thought I'd so, on slideshow. Such a wonderful but, uh, slide. I think you are still on it. Good. I will get out of it. Thank you. And just click down here. Thank you, John. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. That's great. So good. So I actually um, made a decision to go to Calcutta, India, and work in Mother Teresa's home for the day. And actually, it's good to see an old friend, Stanley McAdam, on the call from India. Um, and so this was really a quite inspiring moment for me to. Uh, to go there. And I worked at Caligat, the home for the dying. Um, and this is a picture of my wife caring for a patient. That's actually where we met um, in India uh, some uh, 40 years ago uh, this week. Um, what is significant, and I'll just say it from a British perspective, there are articles in the BMJ saying, hey, they, Mother Teresa did not run a hospice. She didn't have access to medicines. Um, and I, she made no claims to running a hospice, yes, and had the name Home for the Dying. Um, but it's interesting, she didn't have medicines, didn't have appropriate pain control, um, access to pain control medicines. But India to this day still doesn't have access to pain control medicines. And this is INCB data that we have, which looks at milligrams of morphine per person per year. A country like the United Kingdom is consuming something like... Uh, uh, 60 to 70 milligrams per person per year of opioids. And here we have India for a number of years in the 2000s, not consuming any, but down to 0 0.2 milligrams per person per year. And this, you can say this is, um, wow, but let's see what happens when this becomes a reality in situations. <laughs> The woman named Fatima had a massive breast tumor, clearly infected and clearly painful. She has severe pain. She can't sleep at night. Fatima's family says she screams in agony day and night. But because of strict narcotics laws, morphine, the gold standard in pain treatment, is nearly impossible to get in most of India. So Dr. Dam is forced to improvise with readily available analgesics. I think uh, Fatima's cry is really quite piercing and we need no greater reminder of the need for pain control in these situations. But here's another graphic from our website. Um, 
uh, which actually shows India's opioid consumption, not just for morphine, but for other opioids as well. Um, and you can see it is still relatively low in terms of milligrams per person. And all this data is actually available from the Walther Global Care and Supportive Oncology website for all the countries in the world and just updated, I think, for 2020. But we can look at this global consumption and the other different medicines. And here are the, we use five key medicines going forward to get a total. Um, we can also add in methadone, but there is confusion with the use of methadone over the treatment of uh, opioid dependency. Um, but really this becomes uh, very uh, important as we go forward. And I highlight the opioid consumption for the Ukraine. And we can see here that uh, they're still in the single digits, not up into double digits. And I show the Ukraine because of another clinical example, which we'll share with you now um, going forward. The World Health Organization has really identified and said, hey, opioids are essential for cancer pain. And it was cancer pain that was uh, focused on and particularly palliative care for cancer patients. Freedom from cancer pain was at the top of the ladder. Um, and no one has disputed that that is a clinical need. In fact, the WHO has included uh, codeine and morphine in this first essential medicines list. Um, we can look at this. There have been added medicines added now. Um, fentanyl is now on that list. But one of the caveats is that every country in the world should actually have access to immediate release morphine. Um, and that's the most pivotal thing that people need. Charlie Cleland in his work in Wisconsin, and one of the reasons I went to the University of Wisconsin was in fact his work on identifying some of these barriers. And he identified that at major cancer centers um, with, in the United States, cancer patients were not getting appropriate treatment. And he identified that 42% of patients were undertreated and you were more likely to be undertreated for with your cancer pain if you were an older minority female um, here in the United States. And again, these included places like MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and other major cancer centers here in the United States. Uh, the work of the Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative, and I've highlighted David Johnson here, really went started because of a request based on the UK experience to use heroin for pain relief. Um, they did work with the White House and others, and they actually moved to providing morphine or ensuring the access to morphine. And in the United States in Wisconsin, they showed that they could increase morphine consumption for cancer patients, and there was no increase in morphine-related crime, uh, something that we didn't quite see with oxycodone here in the United States. But I, while all this was going on, um, consumption was also rising in Western Europe um, for morphine, but there was no increase in consumption in Eastern Europe, and that remained a significant challenge. Nathan Cherney, together with people from the um, European Association of Palliative Care, together with the European Society of Medical Oncology, did this research looking at opioid policy uh, in Europe. And this may be a somewhat uh, difficult slide to interpret. Um, I remind you that there's no such thing as a free medicine. And they use that terminology. It's actually at no cost to the patient. Every medicine has a cost, but they're available at no, uh, no cost to the patient. And we can see here that in Western Europe, many medicines available. The medicines, the different medicines are across the top, countries down the, the side. And you can say, wow, we got pretty good access. But if we move to Eastern Europe, we see lots and lots of black holes. And we even have a number of countries and uh, where there was no immediate release morphine available. And we had a country such as Ukraine where only injectable morphine was available. So let's hear the story of Artur as we go forward. Here in Ukraine, some of the same bureaucratic hurdles that plague India mean that even a former decorated KGB colonel is left to die in pain. <sighs> Artur Shumanov has stage four prostate cancer and is living out the end of his life alone and suffering. <sighs> 
Я кричу ночью здесь. Артур has found his own way to numb his agony. And if it gets bad enough, Artur showed us his other plan to stop the pain. Really a significant uh, moment. I was there with a film crew of students from the uh, uh, University of British Columbia. Um, they captured this on film. This was not set up. Uh, Artur died some three months after we'd actually left. He did not shoot himself, but he was actually getting appropriate uh, um, morphine or more morphine from the gentleman you saw standing behind him, who was actually taking morphine from patients who were very, very near the end of life, whose family agreed that they may not need, need, as, need as much, and actually moving it over so that Artur had access to this. So why is this? Why don't they have access? And even back in 1995, the International Narcotic Control Board did a survey. Others have done surveys. And some of the impediments, fear of addiction, lack of training, regulations, insufficient opioids, cost. We've got all these reasons as to why this is happening. And we can see that if we, and this is work that we uh, have done um, through uh, the World Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance um, and others looking at this in terms of availability of palliative care. Um, and we address the ba barriers in different regions of the world, the Caribbean, um, Africa, uh, Middle East, um, and the Southeast regions. Um, as we move forward and did a specific study on India as part of this global opioid policy initiative um, and then proposed next steps. And John sort of talked about this as to where we may go with next steps. But this is an example of the graph we produced from these countries. The white spaces are either the countries we didn't survey. I've included the European results that Nathan had previously done. But you can see that many countries in the world have significant regulatory barriers to the access to opioids as we move forward. And for some who don't have that many barriers, and you can look at the, the southern tip of Africa, not as many barriers, access becomes a significant issue as we go forward. So the, the uh, International Narcotic Control Board has identified this, and this is ongoing work now at the UN Office of Drugs and Crimes and the Commission of Narcotic Drugs. The Commission of Narcotic Drugs, the UN body that looks at these issues has actually um, been chaired by uh, Belgium for the last 12 months. And the uh, ambassador from Belgium has made this a critical priority as we move forward. And Belgium's actually providing funding to improve access in the Congo, a number of other places. Australia working to provide um, improve access in the Pacific um, and Southeast Asian region as we go forward. But we're really left with this challenge, and this is from the Lancet Commission, um, that sort of shows graphically the challenges that we face as we move forward. And they've put here the opioid access with the country size, and we can see a very bloated North America, a somewhat bloated Australia, Europe looking relatively normal, um, but the rest of the world unidentifiable. We cannot identify most of the world because their opioid consumption is so low. And just recently, we participated in a meeting with the International Narcotic Control Board to associate, work out what is the appropriate level of opioids the country should be using. And they kept saying at the meeting that the US has high opioid consumption. And I pointed out somewhat pedantically that we know the US has higher opioid consumption, but we have yet to establish what is the appropriate level of opioid consumption for a country. So I think it's bad to say that, incorrect to say that it has high consumption. It certainly has higher consumption, but we need to establish as a community, a scientific medical community, what is the appropriate level of opioids that a country should have. 
The Economist, and I highlight this since 2013, has actually done a quality of death index. And I think this is significant. They've actually improved this lately with under the direction of uh, Dr. Fickelstein at the Lien um, Centre in Singapore. And they've actually advanced the technology and why they still um, ask country experts for their opinions, they've come down to look at the different domains. And the leading domain that they've actually found from interviewing 1,500 people was having their pain and discomfort managed at the end of life is very, very significant. Um, these are the latest results that they've published. Um, the United Kingdom in one, um, Australia equal fourth, but you can see Taiwan and Korea there in this classification. Um, you can scan down that right-hand column, many European countries in there, and they're getting different grades. The color changes with the gray. But if you're looking for the United States, you'll find it up near the top of the, uh, the right-hand column. And so we don't rank very well in terms of the overall access um, to palliative care going forward. Um, Normally, the response in the United States to this is, well, we must be asking the wrong questions if we're not at the top of the list. Um, but I'm don't, not sure that is really quite true. But we do have, and I'm not going to leave the uh, elephant in the room, um, we do have this problem of opioid uh, deaths, associated deaths in the United States. What is interesting, almost none of them at the moment are associated with prescribed medicines. It's almost all from illicit fentanyl that's coming in from Mexico and China. Um, but that's not something you would actually read about. And this is data from um, uh, 10 states looking, and you can even see here, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, almost the percentage of opioid overdose deaths from fentanyl or fentanyl analogs. This is not the fentanyl patch or fentanyl lozenges. This is illicit fentanyl that's coming in. We can see them making up close to, in New Hampshire, almost 90% of the opioid associated deaths. So I think it's important to get this in perspective, but it, you can't talk about opioids in the United States now without addressing this. The CDC put out opioid uh, prescribing guidelines, which has provided a significant backlash. I now have to get a prior authorization in many cases, even to prescribe morphine for cancer patients. Um, and why I mean prior authorization, I need insurance company approval before the patient can fill it. So this is a significant barrier as we go forward. They've just put out new guidelines that exempt cancer patients. They were always exempted in the 2016, but it was the application of these guidelines. And now the new guidelines are saying, hey, we've got to make sure that cancer patients have access to these medicines, particularly at the end of life, but throughout the course of their disease. So what do we need? We need a balanced approach to the availability of the opioids. We need medicine availability. We need good policies and we need education of patients and families. Whereas I used to have many patients actually say, I don't want to be on morphine because of the stigma. I'm now having patients say they don't want to be on fentanyl because of the stigma of uh, the opioids um, in the, the press at the moment. But this is this three-sided uh, issue that we need to address, making sure we cover all these to ensure access for all our patients, um, including the Arturs and Fatima of the world. And I'll stop there, John. Uh, thank you so much for that, um, Jim. That was, um, as always, fascinating um, to hear. Maybe we could just go to, um, um, so questions, if people can, put questions in the, the chat maybe, because if you put your hand up, I may not be able to see you because of the, um, maybe you take the, the slide off, Joan, I, I may be able to see, see hands. So we can try hands, but do put it in the chat if you've got something. Yes, I can see some hands. If, if there's anybody out there with a hand going up, I can in, put you on there. I, I have a question. I have to ask this question to Jim. I mean, one of the things that we were talking about last week in our, um, national meeting for undergraduate education is that second step on the WHO ladder. And really, this is kind of, uh, people tend to feel this is obsolete now. And 
you showed it from 1977. Is it time this, this drug coding, which I particularly think is not that helpful, is it time that we weren't educating about that now? Or what's your view? Yes. Simple answer, yes, I agree totally with you, John. It's a two-step ladder. What we're basically, and if you actually look back historically, and I'll, yeah, I was asked this question at a recent uh, donor dinner and I went on and spoke for 10 minutes, um, but it's, I'll try not to. Okay. The issue is pharma has been involved in this process in the United States for many years. So we have Percocet, which is an oxycodone, acetaminophen, paracetamol combination product. And basically the FDA in the United States and the DEA said you can classify medicines differently if you combine them, the opioids differently, if you combine them with paracetamol or Tylenol. So oxycodone was actually in hydrocodone, codeine products were put in a different bucket. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think the step two came into place is because of the US influence there and also because of codeine. Codeine is a prodrug. It gets broken down to morphine. So it was a way of administering low-dose morphine. And I still remember as a resident intern covering neurosurgical wards, and we were told not to use morphine on those patients, but we could use codeine. And all we were doing was giving low-dose morphine. The WHO pediatric guidelines basically went to a two-step ladder because many children under the age of four actually lack cytochrome P452D6. So you give them codeine and they can't convert it to morphine. And what's the most common opioid prescribed for children in the United States in emergency rooms? Codeine. So we have this real disconnect from practice. And I would agree totally with you from an educational point of view. I think we're moving to a two-step ladder. It's non-steroidals or non-opioids moving to opioids. And if you think about it in the United States, many of the non-steroidals are available over the counter. So we're really, by the time a patient comes to us, we're already moving into the, the top step of the ladder and clinicians are using opioids as the primary uh, uh, medicine at this stage. Thanks. Um... Just, um, I'm pleased to hear we agree on that one, Jim. So that's good. Um, ben, just a question to you about, from all the work, which is fascinating, what, what is your kind of, what would be your one message to um, practitioners in those countries that do prescribe anticipatory medications? What, what do you think, is there a change in practice you would like to see from the research and evidence that you've provided? Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure that practice needs to change everywhere, but I do think we need to think a little bit more nuanced about the right time to prescribe these drugs because they are very symbolic. And if someone's dying, but in months away, it might be helpful for clinicians to make planning, but the patients and families might be thinking, they're not literally thinking about dying. So when you give an ab abstract concept of, a just-in-case bag of anticipatory medications. That means something very different to patients who don't recognise they're yet truly at the end of life. So thinking about prescribing, making sure it's the right time and returning to conversations. Yeah, I think that's that's good advice. I think linking, linking that to a conversation rather than just here are some drugs just in case in the corner of your room. It's, it's, it's a slightly different conversation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and just needs revisiting. All these things are very nuanced and we just need revisiting. And actually, why not use anticipatory medications as a good tool to have end-of-life conversations? Exactly, exactly. Ben, can I jump in on one of the, the thing about it? And we've had this challenge in some places in the United States. I'm glad to see evidence is coming up. But we had some uh, overdose deaths because of incorrect labelling in some of these kits. And I think we have to be very conscious of the safety as we move forward. Um, Medicare got involved in reviewing hospices, but you know the instructions were to family, I'll give, um, and it was family who were administering them, give them a syringe. And they actually had provided two syringes of morphine, one that contained much more than the other. 
So you've got to make sure if you're going to have instructions provided that, you know, it's the syringe labeled with the red tape or the purple tape or with these different medicines on it to help with the instructions so that you don't run into these problems. But that hospice that uh, where this was a problem, a challenge, actually lost its certification and really was quite significant going forward. And, and it makes everyone very nervous about doing it again. And it kind of ties nicely to the re revisiting prescriptions and revisiting decision making. Because if you prescribe two months before someone's end of life, maybe their symptom control needs are different when the last few weeks are there. So kind of linked to what you're saying there, Jim, but it, it, it's very much, we don't want it to go wrong. And we all fear if someone's going to be in pain and distress, but we need to make sure that we don't create new problems by trying to solve one problem. Yeah, um, I think Jim, there's a question in the chat for you here from Dan Tobin. And it's a good question, I think. Is there any indication of consumer demand forming anywhere in the world for proper pain medication with our social media and the power of the public um you'd think this could be some kind of social movement um any signs of that or ways of enabling that so one of the social media so we actually you wall through our program uses social media extensively to try and change this um we're not in the US actually seeing all the baby boomers jump up and down. Um, even since the CDC guidelines, um, there's been a significant backlash for chronic pain patients and others. Um, and people have been trying them out. It's not 90 million people, but the people with pain, I'm trying to mount a response, but my perception is it's going nowhere. And why one of the challenges, and this comes up to the difference between legislature and regulations, in face of all the opioid deaths in the United States, many of our state governments brought in legislative changes and rules, which means if we want to underdo it, we have to go back to the legislature to get it changed. If you just change your regulations, you go down to the Ministry of Health and someone there in the office signs a thing and it changes. But going back to um, legislatures to say, oh, please make these medicines available more so we can have more opioid deaths is a real challenge. And um, that's what we face. But many of the legislatures got involved in changing the policies and rules. So for instance, in Indiana, I am allowed to was allowed to prescribe opioids um, during COVID for patients who had actually um, uh, I would seen by telehealth visits, telemedicine. That has now been revoked um, because we're no longer in an emergency. And so I have to see people in person every four months if I'm going to actually prescribe opioids for them. That's very difficult for people who are coming from 200 miles away. Um, but that's enshrined in the legislature rather than a regulation from the Ministry of Health. So I am some, I hope, we're trying to get celebrities involved. Um, finding a celebrity who's comfortable making a status on this at the moment is very hard, but we know that's a big impact thing. We've seen it when Nancy Reagan had um, a mammogram, mammography went up. Um, we've seen it when Katie Couric got a colonoscopy on television. People went out and got colonoscopies. We need someone to come out. I thought it may happen with Olivia Newton-John a bit. But we need it's people are deaths a private thing, and uh, we're not getting the celebrity status out there to actually really make this a, a highlighted issue. Um, and uh, thanks for that, Stan. Stan McCadden, you'd like to make a, a comment on using anticipated medication. So Stan based in Bangalore in India. So Stan, if you, you're unmuted, over to you. Thank you. Um, just to mention that uh, we have been using the same syringe, 10 ml syringe with a combination of medication that is used on a syringe driver in the UK. And because it is expensive, it is you know highly uh, technical and needs a lot of training. What we have done is we have used the simple method of teaching the family using that same syringe and giving one ml of the combination every four hours 
and in between as needed. And we have found that, you know, it, we get just as good, I mean, you know, wonderful uh, results because the patients are comfortable and the family is managing this. So in honor of these families who are willing to do this kind of thing, we have called it the family driver. So I just wanted to mention that. And we have been doing this for the past 25 plus years. Thanks, Dan, for that. Thank you. Okay, I think um, I've got to say, I think we'll draw to a close there. We want to finish on time. I would really like to say a big thank you to Dr. Ben Bowers and Professor Jim Cleary. I think we've had two fantastic talks. Um, I know that people are listening to this synchronously, but we will get lots of other people listening to asynchronously and using it in education. So I think... Um, Thank you once again to you both for your contributions and hopefully we can maybe um, get you back at a later date for, for further discussion and presentations. Um, just to finalize now, just to mention that uh, many of you are members of the collaborative, but there are some people um, out there that are not. So please do um, look us up um, on, the, on the web. If you just Google best care for the dying, we come up I think first, and then you can see how you can become a member. This is, um, the membership organization, the fees are very low, and um, depending upon the country you come from, um, all healthcare professionals and those researchers interested in care of the dying are welcome to join us. And the uh, benefits of membership include participation in international research projects, um, a reduction in registration fees for summer school, which we hold in Malaga in Spain, and the annual symposium, research symposium, which this year will be held in Rotterdam in November. Also access to the quality improvement framework and audit toolkits to support and improve care for the dying at the bedside and a regular bi-monthly newsletter. So thank you once again for attending this webinar. Our next webinar is um, on the Thursday, the 30th of March, and it's going to be about how do we connect with the bereaved. So you're more than welcome to join us and please um, extend the invite to um, um, friends and colleagues. Um, thanks once again to Ben and Jim and uh, wishing you all um, a pleasant festive season. See you in the new year. Bye-bye for now. Thanks again. Bye-bye.